Right, my name is Stuart Waiton. I'm a lecturer at Aberdeen University. Uh, I'm speaking in a personal capacity, uh, and I thought, uh, as I haven't spoken with Leslie a few times before, I thought Leslie would say stuff about the named person, and then I, that would give me scope to then explain the entire world. Uh, so that's what I will do in the next 15 minutes. So aspects of what I'm looking at are the nature of the state, nature of the uh, modern elite, uh, and the nature of the individual, or the diminished <coughs> nature of the individual within our culture, which I think is central uh, to what's actually happening. So essentially I'm trying to explain why this has happened, right? why we've got the named person uh, initiative uh, and what's actually uh, going on in society to allow this to happen. Uh, fundamentally, which I, I kind of come back to, uh, I'd argue that uh, society has lost a sense of an understanding of the autonomous individual and consequently um, the idea of privacy has been profoundly undermined today, and that's where we find ourselves. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so uh, first point in terms of just issues to raise, I'd say you need, we need to think about our culture and the idea of the uh, diminished subjectivity or the diminished individual or diminished agency in terms of how society thinks about us, i.e. our belief that the individual uh, is fragile, I think, is uh, key to how our culture operates today. Um, if you look at the idea of rights, uh, it's another interesting development in terms of rights have shifted from being associated with the idea of freedom um, to the idea of being uh, protected. Okay, So children's rights are a classic example of that and the discussion of children's rights. Or, as you got in the development in the 19th, discussion about the freedom from fear. So that was a, another uh, kind of framework of how these things became discussed. So what, how we talk about freedom becomes different. It's something that the state helps us with, rather than something we as individuals uh, take for ourselves. Within that context, I think you, what you can see is that there is a shift uh, away from talk about the, f the family uh, towards talking about parents and parenting. And essentially what's happening, I think, is that the, uh, the autonomous institution that was built on the, an understanding of privacy and individuals being free within the institution has now shifted so that we are now thinking about the family in terms of individuals who have competing rights and the regulation, uh, uh, almost like a refereeing framework where the state mediates those relationships between the parents and the children, the parents and the parents, uh, and so on. And part of that framework is also that we see that parenting now is discussed as a skills-based activity. So that's how the family is discussed, less as an institution of significance in its own right, more in terms of parenting, and parenting is something that is a skill-based thing. Right? So that, again, needs professional support and guidance, uh, and so on. Uh, so, and again, so we get the right to have support. Uh, again, that's the, the change in the, um, the language and how this is discussed. So we end up with this. This is David Cameron. I think this was about a week ago. Uh, he says, of course, they don't come with a manual, but it's right that all of us get... Uh, is it right that all of us get so little guidance? We've made progress. We've dramatically expanded the number of health visitors, and that is crucial. Uh, but that just deals with one part of parenting, the first few weeks and months. What about later on when it comes to play, communication, behavior, and discipline? We all need more help with this. The, more important, uh, the most important job we'll ever have, right? That's parenting, the most important job we'll ever have. Not like uh, going to the moon or anything else, uh, changing nappies, etc. So I believe we now need to think about how to make it normal, even aspirational, to attend parenting classes, right? This is a conservative, uh, supposedly, prime minister saying it should be aspirational to attend parenting classes, which is a fascinating thing to think about. Right? So it's as, it should be aspirational to hand over your autonomy as a parent 
to think that you have the capacity to raise your own, ch own children. And that, that is an aspiration, right? so an, an aspiration to uh, being a diminished subject, uh, if you like. Uh, there's a double-edged aspect to the discussion about the family, which relates to whether this is just uh, about poor parents or not. Um, so a lot of people, when they discuss initiatives like the Named Person and GERFEC, think that this is essentially about targeting underclass families, right? poor, poor families and so on. And there is definitely an element of that, but more in practice than in theory. Because if you look at all the papers, if you look at quotes from people like David Cameron, if you look at how they discuss what makes a good parent, they are talking about all parents. Right? They are talking about parenting classes for all parents. Right? They are talking about these initiatives, they're talking about the named person for all parents. It is a universal service. So while in practice, you know, people's prejudices and the way things work out, poorer, poorer sections of society will face the brunt of many of these things. That is not actually in theory what the essence, uh, uh, it's not that helpful to think about it like that, I don't think. I think it's more useful to think that this is a more general, universal uh, change that's taking place. Second point I, th I thought I'd think about is, um, <clears throat> is this idea of uh, what's generating this. Because at road shows around Scotland, there's a lot of... Uh, not a lot, but there's, there's occasionally people will s stand up and say, this is a fascist state. Right. Uh, and I think they're wrong, uh, and I think it's almost the opposite to the truth. But this is not a state that's being led by an ideology. It is a state that operates without one. Uh, and that is actually an incredibly d uh, dangerous uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, in, an, in and of itself, uh, which I'll try and explain. Essentially, I, I think the new elite is a, is a kind of risk management bureaucracy. That is what we have in place today, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain uh, what that means uh, if I can. Okay, so within the context of the um, uh, the campaign, what's interesting about this is that you appear to have two groups of people that talk over each other and there is no point of contact. You have the state, uh, the childcare professionals, the health professionals and the political elite um, who cannot understand why people are opposing what they're doing. Right? They're just, they find it incomprehensible. They think there's, there's nothing problematic about what they're doing. This is just a form of a, a caring policy. Uh, if you like, that's taking place. But of course, the reason that they can think this, uh, from my understanding of look, looking at what's happening, is that they have got a more diminished sense of individuals' capacity to do things and to run their own lives. Right? They've also got uh, an exaggerated sense of uh, the danger that people pose to one another. So you've got these two things going on, uh, I think, within the, uh, the modern elite, for want of a, a better term. Uh, and then the people who are opposed to the named person, I think, are the opposite to that in many respects. I think from, you know, whether it's Leslie or other people in the group, Christians, there's, there's usually, they're usually old school people, essentially the people who are opposed to the named person. They're people who are either socialists, liberals, or conservatives, essentially. Right? Political people, ironically, right? So, but all three, because they st have a fairly solid sense of people's capacity to do things. Right? So you've got a kind of moral conservative sense of defending the family, or you have a liberal sense that people should be free to do things, or you have socialists, a few of them anyway, who think that you shouldn't blame individuals, that you know, society uh, should be understood as being something we should look at as the problem rather than the family. But it, they're all old school people as far as I can see, right? Compared, so it's like the, an old body of, it doesn't mean they all have to be old necessarily. Um, but old school in a way, uh, 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 in contrast with this uh, uh, this new elite. Uh, 
So I just want to say a few things about the framework uh, of the wider framework, if you like, about society and where uh, <coughs> the named person fits into this. How and why has it come about? So I'll just I'll say there's five things. Right? There's five reasons that the named person has come about in terms of trends in society. First one is that, as I mentioned already, there is a a, a, a more intense or exaggerated sense of people being vulnerable right? or at risk, and particularly children. Okay, so. You now talk about the child at risk, it's a kind of common uh, phrase now, or the vulnerable child. And essentially all children are now discussed or talked about as being vulnerable. Right? Now, you, we might think children are vulnerable, but we didn't always talk about children as vulnerable in the way we do now. Um, you know, historically, that is, you know, we've had all sorts of views about children. Today I would say it's a much more universal um, accepted framework that we think about children as being vulnerable. I think the second aspect is that partly because politics has essentially collapsed in terms of a contest, uh, contestation of ideas, parents have increasingly become seen as the cause and solution to an increasing number of social problems. <laughs> So if you're trying to understand about what's wrong with society and how can you change it, increasingly the state shifts onto the issue of parents and parenting. That's, that's uh, the trend that's taken place over the last uh, two decades. Both those things, an increased sense of children being at risk and uh, a, a, a diminished framework for pol politics and an increased sense that uh, parents are the problem, has meant that we now have um, a tendency to see problems and to intervene in the minutiae of parenting. So more and more aspects of parenting uh, are seen as being issues that need to be examined uh, and resolved. On top of that, you've got an additional development, an even a broader development in terms of prevention and the idea that the state should try and prevent things happening, which you can see in terms of health in particular. Right? That the state's role and the role of professionals is to pre prevent uh, damage um, happening in the future. Which I could go on, there's, there's a big discussion about this for, in terms of... Uh, Christopher Last, Lash discussed this in America in the 70s, discussing the idea of survivalism. Uh, you know, without a, a sense of dynamic progress in society, it's, we've become more, it's a, if you like, it's a form of cultural pessimism in the sense that society is more limited, so you have to try and protect what you have, a sort of preventative uh, state. Uh, and then within that framework, you have the rise and rise of risk management as a kind of basis of good practice. Uh, so rather than social values or moral values being uh, something of significance, you start to get more and more state policies and politics built around what they call evidence-based policies, or the science says. There's a kind of neutral, scientific, administrative, managerial framework which dominates uh, political decisions, um, rather than wider political uh, or moral uh, issues. Uh, and so we get early intervention. Early intervention is the key uh, in terms of the arguments that are made about the named person. Early intervention, we need to get in early to prevent uh, uh, problems from happening in the future. Of course, the whole point about early intervention, or the logic of it, is that you have to get in earlier. That's what they mean. Because right? well, you know, early intervention means getting in before problems happened. Well, before problems happened, a problem hasn't happened. Right. But yes, but that's because we have to get in earlier, right? i.e. we have to get in before anything particularly serious has happened. Right? So a much broader, increasingly a sort of myriad and ever-expanding uh, potential of issues can become issues associated with early intervention. I'll just give you a quote. This is the, the discussing Gerfecht uh, and the uh, underlying early intervention ethos. Uh, uh, in one of the Gerfeck papers. I'll just read this. It says, uh, Named persons, lead professionals, and others, 
their need to project the future probability or likelihood of harm uh, and to determine if this harm is significant in nature or not. Projection of probable risk of harm significantly also means that there is a potential for error in terms of what we think may occur. This is no small task indeed. Right. So entirely conscious, you know, at least when they're being honest, that this trying to project into the future what these tiny little problems here might, you know, is, you know, it's like crystal ball games uh, uh, in many respects. Uh, extremely problematic. So within this context, if we think people are more at risk and vulnerable, if we think that parenting is more of an issue in terms of our need to intervene in relation to social problems, um, and if we think then that we need uh, um, professionals to be managing risk, then we've got to have early intervention. That's, that's the, uh, the necessary outcome of this. We've got to have uh, a named person. So essentially, so sort of pull things together a little bit, a major problem we have today within this context is that privacy is an anathema to this approach of risk management. Uh, so the family has, and has, as it has been for a number of years, is discussed as being toxic. Right? So there's a discussion about a toxic family. Uh, there's also a discussion about the, the idea of being behind closed doors, right? which is seen as a problem. Okay, so if you, if you close your door, then it is a, a, a secretive uh, situation because it is a barrier to professionals. It is a bar barrier to the support you need. It's also a barrier to the potential risks uh, that may uh, exist there. So essentially, time and time again at the minute, the family is being uh, undermined um, because as a private institution, it is seen as problematic to this wider uh, new risk management uh, approach. And you can see that in the named person. So, for example, you've you got, uh, you got school surveys uh, which were done based on, well, essentially not getting consent from parents. It was kind of, what was it called, passive consent or something? Yeah, thank you. Um, so you got surveys done that many parents wouldn't have wanted their kids to do, but they uh, but they, ha they they weren't really asked. It was a kind of negative consent. And within these surveys, they were asking sort of ten, eleven year old children things like if they've had anal sex before. Right? These surveys, obviously, that's the most bizarre question. But the very fact that that question was in this survey is illustrative of the kind of uh, fairly unthinking. Uh, kind of casual way that these professionals think you can go into schools now and just do with children whatever you like. Right? It's a very peculiar uh, situation, uh, I think, and illustrative. So you, you've had letters being sent home to uh, parents uh, telling them that if they miss uh, appointments, medical appointments with, with their children, their, their, their named person will be uh, informed about this, even though that wasn't necessarily in lo legally wasn't meant to be the case. The kind of the extent to which the named person um, they just run with it casually again, uh, I think is, is significant. You've had, which most of you probably won't know, there are now Shinari songs sung at school. Shinari are the indicators. Um, named person, safe, healthy, active, nurtured, blah, blah, blah. And there are now songs that are being taught at schools across Scotland, which uh, I will sing to you if I can remember the tune. Um, uh, anyway, I can't remember. There's two of them. One of them's called, you remember? Anyway, they're, they're very they're very catchy. Uh, and they're, they're like clappy songs like this that you teach to children about, you know, Shinari is great, la la la, we have rights, I've got the right, you that's got the right, right yeah. that's one of them. Right. Teaching children to have their rights and what that means and so on and so forth, right? So these are now being taught at school. What's fascinating about this, I think, is that it's so kind of 1984, uh, sort of China Soviet Union type thing that it's don't they realize how stupid this looks right I mean they're just some nice people probably making up songs but they're being paid 
So there's not, people aren't thinking about this maliciously. They just think, oh, we need to teach children about these things. Uh, without any sense that this looks like you're a fascist state or a dictatorial, you know, I mean, it's you know, it was like for anyone opposed to the name person, these things are kind of god sense, you know, because it looks so ridiculous. You know, I mean, what you're teaching children about the Shinari indicators through songs, um, but again, I think illustrative of uh, a, a, a sort of mindset that just doesn't get it. It doesn't get the idea that they, 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 you know there's, there's, there's people called parents and families who actually think there's a problem that all you professionals are running around uh, looking at their children all the time. Uh, and you get uh, nearly finished. Uh, you get uh, health visitors. This is, I think, probably the most worrying because uh, the health visitors are now also going to be named persons. And everyone who has a child will have a health visitor. So there is no escape. Every child will have a named person before and, uh, and during birth. And these are some of the things the health visitor uh, has to do. They have to be, uh, this is the, they have to have eight meetings over the first year. These meetings will last up to an hour each. Uh, and they will include things like looking at the, the emphasis on wider family health. Uh, they will take a, a proactive, health-creating approach. Uh, it'll include breastfeeding benefit awareness talks, uh, a, a need to carry out a routine inquiry for gender-based violence. Right? So when they come into your home to look after your children, they will also be looking to see whether you're beating up your, your, your partner and so on. Uh, core issues to be discussed pre-birth will include preparing the mother and father for parenthood, promoting a uh, tuned, sensitive parenting, raising awareness about the value of talking, stroking, singing pre-birth, and the benefits of brain development, and raising awareness about second-hand smoke. Okay, so this is part and parcel now of your friendly neighborhood person who's meant to be bothered about you know, the weight of your child and so on, uh, is doing all these things. So essentially, I think we have... We have lost or we are losing the understanding of the, uh, the liberal individual. The idea that people uh, are, are or even can be uh, or should be responsible for themselves uh, and their family. We're finding it harder and harder to believe people have the capacity to do things alone. Uh, and they are shocked when uh, parents then stand up to say, actually, we don't want this support. Uh, and assistance, or when campaigns uh, are set up in relation to that. Uh, they genuinely think they are only trying to help, but that's from a very narrow, one-dimensional, administrative, risk-based type of framework. Uh, and, and that, I think, is why we have the named person. Thank you.